Welcome to Peace Now. My name is Trudy Quaif. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We're a local organization of friends and neighbors, and we've been advocating for peace and justice for over a decade. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by Lynn Jackson. Thank you for being here, Lynn. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, let's talk a little bit about Lynn. Lynn is an activist. Uh, she's active with Project Salam, which stands for Support and Legal Advocacy for Muslims. She's also was the co-founder of Save the Pine Bush, and she's active with the Muslim Solidarity Committee. So, Lynn, um, could you tell us why you became an activist and what you started with in your activism career? Oh, well, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I think. I, as a child, I felt very strongly about environmental issues, and I have very vivid memories as a child watching the, uh, the dirty suds from the washing machine going down the sink and asking my mother, like, where did the water go? And, and being grateful that I lived upstream from where the water went. Mm -hmm. But of course, as I got older, I realized that, you know, people downstream, you know, that we're downstream from somebody and that we really need to take care of our environment, which is what started my environment, my great interest in the environment. In 1978, uh, a group of us got together uh, and formed an organization called Save the Pine Bush. And we've spent the last 35 years in almost constant litigation with the city of Albany and other municipalities over construction of projects in the pine bush. We've won a lot, we've lost some, but we won a, won a lot, and uh, today we do have a pine bush preserve. Yeah, and we're, I think we're all very thankful for the work that you've done over the past 35 <laughs> years. <laughs> well, there was lots of us, you know, it's a, it was a group of us, you know, and mm -hmm. I think the one thing that taught me about Save the Pine Bush is to appreciate each individual's contribution because we all had different skills and um, interests but we could all work together to uh, work on preserving the pine bush. Mm -hmm. Well good. Um, what organizations are you working with now? Um, these days I work with the Muslim Solidarity Committee and Project Salam. Um, the Muslim Solidarity grew up, it was a, an organization that started to support the families of Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein. Uh, those two men were arrested on August 4th, 2004 in a sting operation um, and the organization uh, grew up to support their families because um, some people realized that between the two men they had ten children and they needed school supplies. Mm -hmm. um, I also am involved with an organization called the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms which is a national group who works on these issues. So Project Salam uh, grew out of, uh, the Muslim Solidarity was formed to support the families. Project Salam grew out of that because um, we realized that Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein were not the only two Muslim men in this country who were targeted by the FBI um, and convicted of, uh, in a sting operation, and that there are many of these what we call preemptive prosecutions in the United States today. Could you talk a little bit about that term, preemptive prosecution? What exactly does that mean? Um, preemptive prosecution is the um, idea that there is prosecution without a crime being committed or before a crime is being committed. It's really without a crime having been committed. Mm -hmm. um, today in the United States, Muslims are being targeted for their uh, religious and political beliefs. They are often entrapped by the FBI in sting operations. There are actually different kinds of preemptive prosecution. Um, in Albany, it was a sting operation, which means that uh, the FBI sent in an informant and set up this sting. I can talk, I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, but other uh, uh, preemptive prosecutions include uh, charity financing, where, for example, in the Holy Land Foundation, which was the largest Islamic charity in the United States, and the organizers raised millions of dollars to give to um, uh, people in Palestine for schools and hospitals. And these men were convicted of charity and given sentences as long as 65 years. And even though the court agreed that not a single penny of that money ever went to any violent activity, because the money uh, went through uh, organizations in Palestine, uh, they said it was in support of terrorism because it raised the, uh, uh, it made the, because the schools and hospitals were being built, it made the, these organizations look better, therefore 
it was wrong. So uh, preemptive prosecution is a pretty serious issue. There are probably hundreds of Muslims caught up in these cases. The um, sentences tend to be very long, such as in the case of the Holy Land Foundation, 65 years. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the Fort Dix Five, um, and four of the men were given life in prison, some life plus 30 years. Um, and, it's, and in addition, Muslims are often kept in pretrial solitary confinement, which makes it very hard for them to mount a defense. Uh, and it's a pretty serious issue in this country today. How did you meet Yasin Araf, or when did you meet him? Um, that's a very interesting question. I've actually never met Yasin Araf in person. Um, I became involved in this case in, um, let me see, they were arrested in August of 2004. The trial was more than two years later, in October 2006. And they were convicted at trial, and each given 15 years in prison. In 2007, they were sentenced. And at that time, um, I read articles by Carl Strzok, who was a columnist at the Daily Gazette at the time. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a lot about this case because he couldn't believe this was happening in our country. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, uh, Yassin was 37 and I was, what, 53 or whatever, something like that. But there is, I realized that he was going to spend, you know, like 15 years from the time of 37 in prison. And I thought, these are like really important years in your life. I mean, I, I had no idea who he was. I didn't know anything about either men. I didn't know if they were married. I didn't know they had kids. I didn't know anything about them. But um, I decided that um, I didn't want to get involved in this issue because I do environmental work. I didn't do civil rights. I did environmental work. I didn't want to get involved. But I thought um, he liked to listen to Democracy Now! And I thought, oh, I could send him CDs of Democracy Now! once a week. And, and you know, not that I want to get involved, but, you know, I could do that for him, which, of course, you can't, but that's another story. So I wrote him a letter, and I, and I made some CDs of Democracy Now! and packed them up and made a little case for the CD player. And, sent it off to the communications management unit, which is the special Muslim prison he was in. And of course, the, uh, you, can't, you cannot send, in this country, you cannot send prisoners anything mm -hmm. besides um, letters or photographs. Um, and he wrote me back a letter that absolutely broke my heart. And I think that's what started me on this uh, extremely interesting adventure of learning about uh, people that I'm not familiar works because I had no, uh, I had never met anyone who was Muslim before. And um, of course, the entire federal criminal system, which was something I never thought I would know about, and the prison system. And I've certainly learned a great deal. Okay. Um, this past summer, Lynn went on her own personal journey for justice. She walked 133 miles from Albany to the courthouse in Binghamton during the hottest part of the summer. It was over 90 degrees many of the days that she was traveling. Could you tell us a little bit about how you decided to make that journey? Yes. Um, the Journey for Justice came out of um, Yassine's most recent appeal. Now, what happened is that, so in 2007, he was uh, sentenced to 15 years in prison. And um, a year later, an appeal was filed for him, and uh, he lost that appeal, um, even though there was secret evidence used in his case, and there's actually no evidence that Yassin actually did anything, did or said anything that was illegal at all. He had no, you know, he'd never been involved in anything illegal, at any rate. So uh, this injustice eats at me, because mm -hmm. it's very hard to sit here and watch uh, one of my fellow Albanians, you know, all from Albany, to watch him in prison, to watch his family suffer, and to know he's innocent. It's very hard to, to watch this. So um, uh, what ultimately happened is Yassin did a Freedom of Information request for his file from the FBI. And um, it, he got papers back, piles and piles of paper, most of which were whited out. So most of it was redacted, we call it, which was blanked out. Mm -hmm. However, what wasn't blanked out was what's called the caption, which is on the, the, the um, head of each page. And it had his name, Yassin Mohidin Aref, um, his tribal name, Yassin uh, Barzenji. I don't think I pronounced that right. 
But then it had a name that he had never gone by and that he was never known as, and that was Mohammed Yassin. And it turns out Mohammed Yassin was um, someone involved in Al-Qaeda who made bombs and blew off a couple fingers of his hand and eventually was killed in, in, um, uh, in uh, Gaza in, I think, 2010 or so. So what we realized from this caption on, the, the freedom of, uh, on his Freedom of Information Act is that the FBI thought he was somebody else mm -hmm. and that that is why he was targeted, is that they thought he was somebody else. So um, Yassin was going to file another motion. His lawyers would file another motion. And I thought, you know, what can I as a citizen do? What, what can I do to bring attention to his case? Because um, it's now nine years since he's been arrested. He's been in prison almost all of that time. Uh, his family misses him terribly. You know, what can I do? How can I bring attention to this? And I realized that the judge in the case um, didn't live in Albany, that the judge lives in Binghamton, and his home court is in Binghamton. He's a federal judge, and he travels between, you know, different courts, but his home court is Binghamton. And I thought, well, perhaps the judge hasn't seen all of the articles in the paper about Yassine's case, or maybe he's not aware of how much in Albany there is a group who really does care right. deeply about what we think is a terrible injustice done. So I thought, well, what could I do? And I figured, oh, well, I could just walk to Binghamton, no problem. <laughs> Uh, because, um, and the reason for this, uh, the day that we left, a newspaper reporter was there when we left, and the reporter's like, so why don't you just drive it down? <laughs> you know, why don't you just drive you know, uh, down? And I said to him, would you be here if I was driving? <laughs> of course, the Good answer point. is no. So what I did is um, we created an online petition, um, and I used a photo of Yassine and his little daughter, and a prison photo of, the, of him and his daughter, and um, describing uh, his case. And the petition was very simple. All we asked the judge, all we asked, is that he, that the judge give serious consideration to Yassine Aref's petition. And um, I think I got over 1,700 signatures on the petition, ultimately. And That's impressive. And we did a tremendous amount of... Uh, Publicity. Now, a lot of people thought, oh my goodness, you're walking from Albany to Binghamton and it's just, um, there's going to be all these you know, right-wing people who aren't going to care about this issue and it, you know, no one's going to care. But that's not true. I, I met many, many wonderful people. People took me into their homes to, to, to stay. People um, drove me around to do presentations. Um, and in the end, it was an absolutely incredible trip where I met a lot of people, learned about their activism and what they did in their communities, and they learned about what we were doing in Albany. And it was, a, it was simply a, a tremendous experience. I didn't expect that it would be the very hottest days of the year. It was brutally hot, and it became very difficult to actually finish because the... Um, uh, there weren't enough cool hours in the day to walk <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. It was so hot because I only had to, I could only take off so many days from work and I uh, had to finish in 10 days. So it was, uh, uh, but the, but what really struck me is that people, when, when, people are afraid of strangers, right? People are afraid of strangers, but there's no reason to be because people are really nice and people were, wonderful to me. I would be, I was pretty obvious. I wore um, a yellow vest, a big huge hat, and um, one of my friends gave me a walking stick, which without which I never would be able to finish. So I looked pretty distinctive, wa and walking down Route 7, there's not a lot of pedestrians on Route 7. No, there aren't. <laughs> and, um, but we would go, sometimes we would walk by and people would shout out, you say, are you the walkers? Are you the walkers? And we would say yes, and talk to them, or um, so once early in the morning, I, I was getting coffee at a little store, and the uh, woman said to me, are you, are you the walker? And I said, yes. And a man behind me says, I'll buy her coffee. And he didn't really talk to me, but he just, I'll buy her coffee. <laughs> and, and it was just a, um, a really good way to bring up these issues of injustice in our, in our system. Because most people, once you got out of the, the sphere of cap the capital region, Nobody really had ever heard of Yassine or knew about this plight in our country of targeted uh, mm -hmm. Muslims. Now, how many people walked with you? 
Um, some days, uh, uh, when I started out, we um, had a huge rally at the, the mosque here in Albany, at the Masjid al-Salam Mosque. And um, about 100, 150 people came to the rally, and we walked one mile to um, a library on Western Avenue where we were going to start the next day. The next day I was greeted with, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 people greeted me, which I was just astonished. That <laughs> and we walked, you know, and people walked uh, a little bit. Um, eventually, uh, a lot of days it was, some days it was just me, some days it was four or five people. People joined me, people showed up, people did all kinds of wonderful things, and it was, it was great. We didn't actually, ultimately, what did happen is um, I got so far behind that we, uh, actually decided we'd walk on our hands and paddle in the Susquehanna for 25 miles, which we did. I almost drowned. That's another story. Um, so we didn't actually walk that part. And then at the end, um, I got a blister and I couldn't finish it. So I actually walked about 82 miles. But as my friend said, it takes a, um, it may take a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a community to deliver a petition. And so uh, Jack Gilroy from Binghamton stepped up to the plate, and he walked the last two days for me uh, because I was not able to because of my ridiculous blister. So in, in the end, and we got a tremendous amount of publicity, um, the very last day we went to the courthouse to deliver the petitions, asking the judge to give Yassine serious consideration. And um, about 40 people showed up at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning on a brutally hot day to help deliver the petitions. And we had a rally, and we had speakers, and uh, we delivered the petition to the judge, um, to judge's court. You know, we went to the court. I never met the judge. Um, and it was, uh, I think, a very good a very good event. It brought a lot of attention to yeah, the issue. it certainly did. I think it was a wonderful way to raise public awareness, really. And it took a lot of courage and stamina and strength on your part. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anybody can walk a couple of, <laughs> I mean, I went about two miles an hour. <laughs> this Still, was not, that's a lot of walking. <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, there is nothing like walking many, many miles. I discovered it very, it was a, I almost felt guilty I had too much fun. <laughs> well, um, how has this affected Yasin Aref's family? How, and how's his family doing now? Um, it's extremely difficult out of family to have the wage earner simply removed from the family and taken away and sent to a prison hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Yassine's family, Yassine came here, he and his wife and then three children came to this country as UN refugees in 1999. Um, his wife did, does not work and he was the wage earner, he was the uh, part-time imam of the Masjid al-Islam Mosque. Um, he also worked um, cleaning toilets at Albany Medical Center, uh, driving an ambulance around, um, those kinds of things. Um, in some ways, I almost feel his family suffers more than he does. Um, it's, he has um, uh, four children, and um, they miss him terribly. It's very hard, you know, when, you, when he was first sent to the Communications Management Unit, the communications management are special Muslim prisons, and they were formed in the um, in around 2006. I think the first one was opened, and what they do is they severely restrict the prisoner's ability to communicate with the outside world. So, for example, um, you're not allowed. Yassine was not allowed to hold his baby when she came to visit, or sit next to his wife. Now, these are things that in regular prisons prisoners are able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that isolation really eats at you. It's a very, it's a very difficult thing. So in order for Yassine to visit his family, they would be, my understanding is that it's a little tiny room and it's, you know, so his family's in one little tiny room, he's in the other little tiny room and there's a glass in between them with phones. And when you have little kids, it's hard. I mean, you have, you know, he has his wife and four children. How are they going to talk to him on the phone? He was in, um, first he was in the communications management unit in Terre Haute, Indiana. He was there for two years, and then he was moved to the communications management unit in Marion, Illinois. And uh, these prisons are about a thousand miles from Albany, and um, his wife, his family doesn't have a car, so in order to visit 
Yassine, someone would have to drive the family. So you have to get a pretty big vehicle to take right. the five family members. It would take two days of driving to go to the prison. And then they were only allowed two hours a day visiting time. And it was only during the weekday. So you couldn't visit on the weekend. So it's really, if your children are in, are in school, school, it's very difficult. So maybe he was visited by a me member of his family maybe once a year for oh. four years, which when you have little children, his kids at the time, the oldest child, when he was arrested, I believe was around 11 or 12. And it's, um, it's, it's just plain mean. Even if he'd committed a crime, it would be mean, but he didn't commit any crime. So it's even worse. It's a terrible challenge. He did um, file a lawsuit with the Center for Constitutional Rights about his um, prison conditions. And um, once he filed that lawsuit, he was released into the general population in Marion, Illinois, and then eventually moved to low security prisons in Pennsylvania. So now his prison situation is more of, is, is um, much better. He's not in the communications management unit, but still to visit his family is, is very difficult, difficult. Very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, do you th what are his chances of getting out anytime soon? How much longer do you think he'll have to stay in prison? Um, Yasina Ref's uh, release date is in October of 2018. Um, he, if he wins his appeal, I mean, if in a, in a fair and just world he would be out today. Right. Um, if he wins his appeal, of course, that would would make a difference. Uh, but it's a uh, he is looking at at least four and a half more years in prison, which is um, pretty brutal when you didn't do anything wrong. Now, the latest appeal is based on the fact that it, he was apparently uh, targeted based on the fact that they thought he was somebody else. Yes. So yes. do you think there's a chance that he might actually prevail in this case? Um, I would like to hope yes. There, you always, my feeling is we always have to have hope that justice will be done in these cases. Mm -hmm. We have to have hope that the justice the justice system will see that a mistake was made and that mm -hmm. he is in fact innocent and that he will be let go. Mm -hmm. And that is my, my deep hope. So. All right, well, we only have about five more minutes, so let's talk a little bit about some of the organizations that you're working with and the projects you're working on to try to assist Yassin and his family and other Muslims. Do you wanna tell us about Project Salam and some of the projects you've been working on? Um, yes, Project Salam was formed in August of 2008 um, when Yassin lost his appeal and we began to meet other people in this situation. The keynote speaker was Lynn Stewart, who was an attorney um, who um, vigorously defended her client. It was given 10 years in prison uh, for vigorously defending her client, which to me is an outrage. Um, yeah. There is some success because she was recently released from prison on a compassionate release. And so we were very happy that about in, on uh, January 1st, she was released from prison. So there is hope for these cases. Um, we deal with uh, the cases of preemptive prosecution and the targeting of Muslims. And um, the, uh, this particular kind of issue, we have a, a database of, um, of people that fall into this category. We have maybe 800 names on that database right now. Anyone can look at the database. It's at projectsalam.org. That's project, S-A-L-A-M, dot org. Um, and that is primarily the organization that I, I work with. Every year, the Muslim Solidarity Committee here in Albany has an event surrounding uh, at the anniversary of Yassin and Muhammad's arrest to, bring, you know, to let people know that we have not forgotten them. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I am very happy to go and speak to people about the journey for justice or this kind of issue. Um, uh, I've gone as far away as Chicago on speaking engagements, and I'm always happy to talk about this issue. Um, so I hope people will feel free to contact me at projectsalon.org, and um, we'd be very happy to talk more about the, this, this particularly uh, injustice that's happening in our country today. Um, two books that we have here today. Uh, do you recommend these books? Are these? Oh, the this is this book, Son of Mountains, was written by Yassina Reft in the five months that he was in um, uh, between the time he was convicted and when he was sentenced. It's an absolutely amazing book. People in this country have no idea the challenges that people overseas can, you know, in countries such as Iraq, 
uh, have. Um, and also, this book, Rounded Up, was written by Shamshad Ama, the uh, president of the Masjid al Salam. And it's all about the case, and it explains everything about Yassin's case. It it's, a, it's a really, it, this book reads like a, like a, a, a novel. You can still purchase this book. Um, in a book form, and we are hoping very soon to have this in an electronic format so people can download it. That'll be great. So, uh, but I highly recommend, when I, I mean, I knew this story, and when I read the book, it took me, I read it in a day, and I couldn't put it down. It was like a, it was almost like a, a novel, but it isn't. It's all true. And it's just amazing that, that this kind of thing um, could happen today. So the full uh, title is Rounded Up, Artificial Terrorists and Muslim Entrapment After 9-11. I think we still have a minute or so. Uh, what's next for Lynn Jackson? What's your next project going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I hope to work more on these issues of preemptive prosecution of Muslims, and that is my biggest um, challenge, and to speak more about these issues. And maybe I'll go on another walk. Another walk? <laughs> have you decided where? No. but. I decided I really like to walk it because it, it is a tremendously peaceful way to meet people and, and, learn, and learn from them and learn and let them know what you're doing. It is a most, um, you know, we, our society is so fast in cars and when you get out of your car and start walking, you can learn so much and see beautiful things and meet wonderful people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would go on a walk again in a minute. I hope I can join you. I hope some of our viewers will think about joining you, and I hope maybe they'll join you with Project Salam. And I'm so thankful that you're here today. <laughs> I hope you'll come back again in the future and tell us about the case and how things are going, how the appeal is going. Oh, I would be very happy to come back and talk about you know these cases and other cases and to get more in detail about the communications management unit, the, the, the prisons, the fact that many of the Muslims are kept in solitary confinement, which is really quite brutal, mm -hmm. um, and some of these other cases when you actually pick them apart and you look at it and you say, why are these men in prison? Like, what did they do? Like, mm -hmm. they didn't do anything. Why are these men in prison? And it, the, um, the targeting of Muslims in the, our country today, which is un-American and unjust. It is unjust, and I think that's a good way to end it. Thank you, Lynn Jackson, and thank you all for joining us. I hope you'll join us for this and for future shows where we'll be, uh, uh, one of our next shows, we'll be talking about the future of nuclear war and what war has done to our local and national economies. Thank you. Our 